Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Engelbard. Today I've got something, well, a lot different for you. I sat down and spoke to Tommy Tallarico, the president and CEO of Intellivision, about the company's upcoming game system, the Intellivision Amico. Just a few things for you to consider before I roll the interview. There are some things that I agree with Tommy on, and some that I don't, but I hope it's clear that I'm not out to either promote or destroy either him or the Amico. Now I know there are some people who might say that, oh, you're promoting him just by having him on in the first place. And I strongly disagree with that sentiment. How do we get our gaming information back in the 80s and 90s? We got it through magazines, things like EGM, GameFan, Next Generation, GamePro, and a whole huge host of others. Now do you think there's any way, any way at all, that those magazines would not have covered an upcoming game system like the Intellivision Amico and said that they weren't doing it because they didn't want to appear to promote it? <laughs> no, that's a ridiculous premise on its face. Those magazines covered things like the Bandai Playdia, the Apple Pippin, the Konix Multisystem, the Commodore 64 GS, and a whole huge host of others. And I'm also going to add that Tommy actually sat down with me twice last week because I had issues with my recording the first time around. I didn't ask him the exact same questions both times, and for things that I did bring up in the first interview that came up again in the second, I made sure to mention those during that interview so you'll see that pointed out as you watch this one. I didn't ask him beforehand if there was anything off limits, I didn't pre-screen any questions for him or tell him anything that I was going to ask him about. I asked the questions that I wanted to ask that I thought would be of interest to people that wanted to know more about the Amico in general. If one of those questions would have caused him to get upset and say, you know what, this interview's over, I'm out of here, I would have been okay with that. <laughs> but that didn't happen and I only got to about maybe one third of the questions that I had and Tommy has even agreed to come back in the future. I will also say that of course I treat him with respect during the course of the entire interview. So if that alone is something that is going to bother you, well, maybe this interview isn't for you. That doesn't mean that I let him off the hook, and I actually ask him what I consider to be some fairly difficult questions. And if there's anything that I thought he was wrong on, I actually call him out a few times during the interview. But the point in the end is, I just wanted to know more about the system, and I think other people also want to know more about it, and maybe hear some questions that they hadn't heard asked before. So it's in that spirit that I conducted this interview. So if you're cool with all that, well then, go ahead and watch on, my gaming and retro gaming friends. So we talked a little bit about how you got involved with Intellivision, that you had the system as a kid, played a lot of games on it growing up, uh, a lot of multiplayer stuff with friends and family. I did. Is there anything else you'd like to add about how you got into it or directly involved with the company as its president and CEO? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was good friends with the uh, former president, uh, Keith Robinson, who started at Intellivision in 1981, I believe. He worked on the Tron game. He was the programmer for that. And, um, and we, were, we were always uh, good friends, and, um, and he knew my passion for Intellivision, so he, you know, at, at uh, about f like four or five years ago, I was telling him, uh, he's like, hey, we, you know, we should... Uh, you know, he was looking for like business advice and, and things like that. And so, um, uh, and I was saying, gosh, you know, we should just do, just do another in television, like a new one and, and, you know, make it a family system. And, you know, cause I saw the, the, you know, what was happening with mobile and what was happening, uh, in the home consoles. And I'm like, you know what, I think, you know, there's, there's room for something in between super hyper casual on mobile and, hardcore on you know uh uh you know on in the home and um and so uh he liked the idea um but then he suddenly passed away uh, of a heart attack and i reached out to the other folks uh the other people who also partly owned in television and they started at Intellivision in 1981 as well. They worked on games like B-17 Bomber and, and uh, Space Spartans, uh, things like that. And, um, and I had them over my house and I gave them my pitch and they said, this is great. Yeah, count us in. 
And uh, so we formed a new entity. The old company was called Intellivision Productions. And we formed a new entity in television entertainment, the reason for that, and then just moved all of the assets and games and uh, you know patents and all that, we moved that over into the new company. The reason for that is I knew that I had to uh, raise tens of millions of dollars in order to um, you know in, in order to you know launch a, a new console. And the other company really wasn't set up you know for that at all. So we formed you know. Uh, uh, an LLC in television holdings. And then you, you put your form other LLCs underneath it, one for the hardware, one for the patents, one for the old games, one for the new games. We have a European office, a Middle Eastern office, you know, and you kind of, you know, to, to properly be, uh, you know, when you're bringing in investment money, a, a company structure has to be set up a certain way. And then we just, uh, you know, uh, me and a, a you know, guys like David Perry and some of the original in television folks, like I said, and uh, our CFO, Nick, um, you know, we put in a bunch of our own personal money and uh, away we went and uh, we started, we've been raising money ever since and uh, we'll continue to do so. Okay. So when did you really have the first idea for the Amico then? How far back was that? I mean, you know, when I was 12 years old, I would uh, make the Intellivision logo in my notebooks and you know, yeah, okay. I would design games for Intellivision on graph paper. And, uh, you know, so like I remember back then, you know, me and my brother, my younger brother talking about like, you know, someday I'll be the president of Intellivision and we'll, you know, so it's like kind of crazy, like, you know, childhood crazily enough i did some more things there in my you go, right so you know you, yep. you know how it is when you're yep. a kid right so you always think you know all this just manifested from a 12 year old's mind um but but i started seriously thinking about it um like i said about five years ago when i when i approached keith um or when me and keith we didn't i didn't really approach him we were just kind of he was at my birthday party and we were talking about it you know um and, um, you know, because I, uh, what, and, and kind of the light bulb moment I had was that, you know, like there's no games that I can play with my mom and dad anymore on any modern console. There's, you know, like hyper casual games, right? Because people, you know, a lot of people will comment and say, yeah, but why are you trying to do what you're doing when the Switch already exists? The Switch is kind of the in-between, between mobile and the PlayStation 4 and 5. And it's, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not, you know, it, it has more, uh, you know, family and co-op style games than Xbox and PlayStation and PC, for sure, right? But, uh, but you know, my mom isn't buying a Switch, you know, my 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 78 year old dad isn't buying a switch. Um, a lot of people, you know, the the Wii is a perfect example where it sold 102 million units were sold, and over 35 percent of those, so 35 million of them, roughly, uh, no one ever bought a a game for it. You know, so my mom was one of them. She spent 249 dollars 15 years ago just to, to do the bowling thing. And it was something that she could do with her friends and family. And it was real easy. So when you talk about like, well, what are, what are casual games for the switch? And people will tell you, well, it's Mario Kart and maybe animal crossing and, and like a game like overcooked. Right. And so I'll give you an overcooked example. And I love overcooked and I love the developers. So I don't, I don't mean to, and I love Nintendo. So I don't, I don't mean to, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to like be negative in any way towards that. I'm just, you know, telling you the, you know, my reality. Um, so, I, you know, I sit my, or me and my wife sit down to, to, uh, to play overcooked and the first, and she grew up on video games. She's younger than me. She's 35 years old, probably around your age. Well, uh, you know, she's younger up, than me. How old are you? 44. You're 44. Okay. Uh, you look young. You're looking good. All right. Yeah, good on you. Thanks. Good on you. Um, and, um, and so the, uh, and, and so she was part of the Pokemon generation, you know, millennial generation. And, and so she likes video games. She played them growing up and then she doesn't really play them anymore, you know, um, not on consoles. And, uh, and we sat down to play Overcooked. I'm like, oh yeah, it's a cool game. And, you know, 
And she's like, wait, I got to cook and clean dishes. She's like, I, I, I don't like to do that in real life. Why would I want to do that in a video game? <laughs> and, and, and then she's like, and there's this like two minute countdown and it's like panic, panic, panic. And, and she's like, I just want to relax. I just want, you know, and, and, and it's, it's interesting when you start to get into the minds of like a female uh, non-gamer, you know, and, and you can start to understand why things like Candy Crush and, you know, you can kind of just like unplug and just get these little endorphin hits as you're matching three and, and this and that. So, so there's a big difference between casual games on a console and hyper casual games which is what most people play on their mobile device. And the, and the same with edutainment. Remember, you know, when me and you were growing up, there were lots of edutainment titles, educational things, Sesame Street, Nickelodeon, all these different things for the consoles. That's not the case anymore, right? Because yeah, it really. all moved over to mobile. Now, What's the biggest problem with mobile? So, so, so I think we, we might both agree that the overwhelming majority of hyper casual games are on mobile and the overwhelming majority of edutainment is on mobile. Well, but what's the problem with mobile? One, all they're trying to do is suck as much money out of you as possible, right? The games are literally being designed to give you a little bit and then pull it back so that you'll spend money, right? So that sucks. And number two is the biggest thing is that this is a solitary device. So that means that every single hyper, I don't want to say every single, but I'm being over dramatic, but you know, what I the overwhelming majority of hyper casual games and the overwhelming majority of edutainment are just single player experiences, you know, like by themselves. Now, you know, yes, there's hyper casual games that you can play online and they, you know, they put up fake Facebook pictures, Facebook pictures and like pretend like you're playing somebody else while they, they're just trying to sucker you into spending money. I'm talking about couch co-op people in a room together. Some of our greatest moments of gaming is when there were we were with other people. For me, it's the Intellivision with my mom and dad and younger brother, or GoldenEye with my friends on the N64, or Bomberman, or Mario Kart on Super Nintendo, or all the Tekken tournaments we used to have. And those are the best video game moments of my life. And, and when you talk to a lot of people, they'll say the same thing. Like, yeah, my, my favorite gaming memories or when I was with a bunch of people and, and, and we see that becoming more and more rare in home consoles and switch does it the most for sure. But are they getting those hyper casual gamers, those 35 million people who never bought a game for the Wii, like my mom, they're not buying switches. And, and the other thing here, the last point I'll make, and we can move on is there's 200 million hardcore gamers in the world. That's Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, and, and the PC master race, the hardcore PC gamers, right? That's, there's 200 million people, but 3 billion people that play this every day. Those are games, not who, who have phones. Those are games. A report just came out last month, 3 billion players, and there were 2 million unique video games that came out last year across iOS and Android. That's 40,000 new games a week, right? Insane. So, but my, my point being is that, again, let's, let's compare to Nintendo Switch and say, you know, there's about 55 million Nintendo Switches in the world, right? That means that out of the 3 billion people in the world that play video games, 2% of them are playing on a Switch. You know, so people, when people say to me like, oh, well, you should never attempt to do anything new and unique and different uh, for the family because Nintendo already owns that market and, and, and everybody has Nintendo Switch. Well, no, they don't. I just proved to you, the numbers prove that it's not even close. So what about the other 98% of the people out there? What about the other 2.95 billion people? 
you know, they don't own a switch. Can we give them, create something for them that maybe they would be interested in that the switch isn't, you know, why didn't my mom buy a switch? Well, it's dual analog sticks. It's kind of, you know, it's confusing. You take it along with you. It's, you know, a lot of the content isn't for her. She just wants to do this, right? You know, whatever. So anyway, that's my story. <laughs> yeah, okay. And just for where I stand on this, I'm not one of these people that thinks that the Amico doesn't have a right to exist or anything like that. Right, I mean, right, yeah. Anyone can release anything they want into the market and try to make a success out of it. It's what people do. It's why products exist. Yeah, well, you know, hardcore gamers are, you know, our target market isn't hardcore gamers. So yeah. I can understand why certain hardcore gamers hate the machine or, yeah. or the negative or machine or more really they just don't understand it, right? Because yeah. they're in their their bubble and they're like, well, I don't like this. So no one else in the world probably will like it either. And that's just not the case. But it would be like me coming out with like a, a heavy metal album and trying to sell that to people who love country music, right? The country music people are not going to like the heavy metal album. Well, it's the same thing here. If you love PlayStation and you're looking forward to PlayStation 5 and Xbox and you love that, yeah, you know what? This system might not be for you and that's okay. That's okay. You don't have to, you know, no one, everyone in the world doesn't have to like it. But we know from our market research that there's a ton of people out there in our corner that are being ignored in the video game industry right now. And that's what excites us the most. And you answer probably a bit of this already but why go through all the trouble and expense of engineering mm -hmm. a bespoke console and controller rather than say yeah spinning the Intellivision brand off into a software company releasing games for existing platforms that's a great question and 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 it comes it harkens back to that ease of use factor right you could give my mom and my dad or my wife you could give them an Xbox for free. You could give them a Switch for free. You could give them a PlayStation for free. You could give them a $3,000 awesome PC setup for free, and they won't turn any of them on. They won't turn them on. You know, the controller for my dad and mom, non-starter. Dual analog sticks, shoulder buttons, so many buttons they won't even pick it up. Right. So, so if, and that's, that's the reason why. Yeah. I mean, I wish it was as easy as, Hey, you know, it saved us a lot of time, money and heartache and, and you know, and complexity. If I could just put out in television games, simple, easy games on all the different platforms. Um, but that's the idea, right? The idea is that, is that those platforms are too hard for the average person. And by the way, like I said, we did a lot of market research, not only on our machine, but on the industry itself. And not only us, but independent researchers and just tons of, you know, there's tons of uh, reports out there that you can dig into and you'll find, again, why 3 billion people on this and only 200 million on consoles and, and PC, which is 7%, that's less than 7% of the people who play video games in the world are playing them on the console. 93% of people are not into console gaming and PC gaming. And you ask, why is that? And the answers are very simple, is that it's too complicated. It's too expensive, they feel. It's to, um, you know, there's a lot of like for the average person, they feel a lot of the content is violent and it's not for them and it's too solitary and they don't really quite understand it. So literally every single thing, when I looked at these reports, every single thing that those 93% of people out there don't like about the home consoles, every single thing, every point, we actually take care of. Right. So that's, that's, again, I, I like our chances, you know, uh, knowing the research and, and this and that. And, and again, people shouldn't be against that. Look at the system's not for you. It's not for you. That's cool. That's fine. No one's got a gun to your head saying you have to buy this and you have to accept this. It, you don't have to do anything. And, and I always hearken back to remember when the Nintendo Wii was first announced. Oh, 
everybody hated it. Nintendo fans hated it. Sony and Microsoft people certainly hated it. The press hated it. They hated the name. They Everybody was. Well, the name against. is terrible. There's no question about the that. The name still sucks, right? We, I hate saying it. It's, um, um, you know, and so remember that. And then remember when the Xbox came out? Oh, my Microsoft's a stupid spreadsheet company. What did they know? I hate Bill Gates and everybody hated Microsoft and everybody and Xbox was going to be a failure. How dare they go into a category which Sony and Nintendo already own and, and Sega was just on its way out. But, um, and, and then, and then they play Halo and all of a sudden like everything changes, but more, but the most recent one was the Nintendo switch. When the Nintendo Switch came out, there were articles written saying Nintendo should just go the way of Sega. They should just create software for all the other systems. They're crazy. No one's going to buy this. This sucks. So again. Well, they were know. just coming off one of the biggest failures in their history at that point. So that's why there was a lot of call for that. Wii U, which was like total trash, right? Well, so actually, games are Wii good, U but... as a system was actually good. I like the Wii U, you know? It's just, I don't think it was marketed. I think the Wii U is okay. It had its share of good games. There just weren't nearly enough of them. Exactly. No one supported it. It was too expensive to support. Now, yeah. I don't know about oh. you, but I hated just even holding the gamepad and trying to use it to play games. Way too big. Way too big. So going in a slightly different direction, but along these same lines, sure. there have been a lot of high-profile failures in the console business. Some from well-known yep. electronics companies like Panasonic and Sharp. Others from game-related companies like How about Razer, Google with Mad Stadia? Cats, and Ew. even Ouya. <laughs> the Steam Box. Stadia, well, Stadia is a little different because it's not just a yeah. one-system yeah. box that you purchase. But anyway, uh, what type of research have you and your team done to help determine why these systems failed? And what are you going to do differently with the Amico to help ensure its success? That's a great question. That's a great question. Not many people ask me that. I'm glad, I'm glad you asked. Yeah, we, I did massive, re and not only me, but people on my team as well. We did massive amounts of research. I, I did massive amounts early on before we even, you know, announced this and, you know, we're still looking into it, um, especially to Ouya. Right, because because if there's anything we're probably the most similar to, and maybe concept kinda, because we're we were both Android based, but I mean, there's so many things that are different. Um, but uh, yeah, but I looked in, and I I can tell you all the reasons why Ouya failed, and 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 there's there's not just one. There's you know there's a handful, and uh, and again, we're doing everything exactly the opposite. So. Whoa. I'm going out. Uh, Woohoo! Okay, there you go. There went you on, go. I went blurry. I mentioned Ouya, yep. and everything went to hell. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah. So so very much dove into those. I mean, I don't know if you want me to to get into the weeds on what the the specific failures were for each. Yeah. So I was I was actually going to ask you about that anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you don't have to go into a ton of detail about this, but for the Ouya specifically, what would you say were its top? two or three major failure points. Sure. Uh, the first thing was, is that the people that made it, um, although they were in the video game industry, kind of, you know, like they sold ad space on IGN, you know, they weren't game makers. They weren't game developers. We have 600 years of experience on our core executive team. And these are people who created the Xbox. These are people that helped to create the PlayStation uh, architecture. These are help people who helped launch the Nintendo Wii, including the former president of Nintendo, uh, their internal uh, R&D team. Um, we have people who created the greatest games in the world from Guitar Hero, Tony Hawk, Metroid, Sonic, Castlevania, Metal Gear Solid, Dance Dance Revolution. I mean, I can go on and on, on and on and on and on. These are people that helped to create all those games, right? And so when you have real game makers and game producers and marketing people and hardware people 
all coming together who are so passionate. Uh, they're just as passionate as I am, right? You know, you don't hear much from those people because I'm always the one kind of out there talking, but um, they're just as passionate as I am. So that's one huge, huge factor. The second factor is that we have a very, very clear cut vision of who this is for, who our target market is, how we're going to get to them and what they want. Like I said, that report that I brought up earlier, we know what people are begging for. I'm not sure that anyone was really asking too much for what the OUYA was offering. Hey, let's play mobile games uh, on my, on, uh, in my living room, right? Um, you know, and that's not really, you know, and they were going for a, for a you know, kind of a gamer type audience. Our, our thing is completely different. Every single one of our games is multiplayer. Every single one of our games is $9.99 or less. Every single one of our games, you know, is, is, can be played no matter what your skill level is. So if grandpa wants to play with the grandkid and, and, and the mom and they all, the three of them want to play together, they can all feel like they have a chance of winning. You know, that, that's an important thing, which is, again, one of those things in all the reports, you know, is that, uh, yeah, you know, you know, like getting up to speed, like if, if a casual gamer tries to play Fortnite with their friend, it's a bloodbath, right? And the friend isn't having fun. And they're not having fun either, you know, and, and so, and so that's another thing, the whole balancing issue of creating a fun experience that's balanced where anyone can play. So, so yeah, those are the big, I would say the biggest differences. And what would success look like for the Amico? How many units would you have to move in what amount of time to be able to look at things and say, yeah, this is really where we want this to be right now. Yeah, well, I mean, I can tell you this, uh, the way we've set up the company and set up everything, because we've created this really awesome and unique ecosystem um, that I can tell you that we all we have to do is sell around 200,000 units across the lifetime of the product to break even, right? So, so you know, I, I, I would say, you know, a million units would, would be successful I wouldn't think it's successful, but it would, it would really, you know, that's five times return on an investment um, at a million units sold. That would, I'm sure a lot of people would classify that as successful, but I'm a dreamer. I'm a, I, you know, I'm a big believer in the secret and positive mental thinking. And, you know, you know, why shouldn't I, uh, you know, have a, I'm a goal setter as well. Why shouldn't I have a hundred million units on my wall? Why shouldn't I think that you, we, we wouldn't be able to sell 10 or 15 million units? You know, you, you think of something like the Dreamcast, which people say is a big failure. I love the Dreamcast. Uh, the Wii U we just talked about. Oh my God, it's a big failure. They did 15 million units. So, so if, if you're going to classify those as a failure, then, hey, I'll raise my hand. I'll take 15 million units. You can call me a failure all day long if you'd like, you know. So, so, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I think, you know, I think selling a million units, a lot of people would say, wow, that's a big success um, for me. So what's the time frame in which you'd like to see a million? Sold? Me personally or for the company? Well, both. Why not answer both? Yeah, I mean, I mean, for the for the company, um, you know, I, I mean, for 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 people who invest in the company and people who follow the company, you know, f four to five years they're fine with that. Like, Oh, if I can get five X return in four years, that's a good investment. That's a good, it's better than bank interest, right. Or the stock market could potentially get you. Um, but for me, um, we, and, and our internal goals, um, are that, you know, we want to see a million units, um, you know, over the first year, over the first year, to a year and a half. Like it, if we have a million units, even by Christmas of 2021, I'd say we're doing, you know, we're on our way. See, because I'll, I'll give you a little insight uh, to, to the way, you know, hardware manufacturers in the industry, basically all of the, all of the hardware is a big bell curve. You look at every single, again, PlayStation, Nintendo, Microsoft um, over the years, 
And there's always this big bell curve. And a PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X are going to see the same exact thing. All the top numbers are different always, but the bell curve is this. Year one, year two, and then by year three and year four and year five is when the big numbers happen for the console. Then it levels off around year five, and then it starts to go down year six and go down year seven, right? That's the big bell curve. So when you, and you look at the Switch, you look at the PlayStation 4, you look at the Xbox One, they all did the same thing. And you look at every console for the last 30 years and you'll see that same thing. So again, for us, we don't have to sell 10 million units out of the gate to pay, or else we're a fail. No, you know, we could sell a, you know, again, we sell, you know, a million or two. It, by the time we get to year three, that's when we want to be established. We want to be on people's mind. We want to have a lot of systems out there so people can try them. We want to have a good presence at retail by that year three, Christmas 2022. And if I can get the price, and I know I can by then, we'll get the price down to 199 with two controllers and six free games. Boom. That's when we take off. That's our short-term goal. Get the thing at 199 by Christmas 2022. Get a million or two units. And then, then we're on the launch pad for that year three. And that's when we're going to you know, take off big time. And what type of generational lifespan do you see for the Amico? It's a great question. Most, most hardware systems, as I'm sure you're aware, are seven-year cycle, right? We think we're going to be longer than that because let's take the Wii as another example. The Wii's 15 years old. My mom, and I know a lot of people, I'm sure you do as well. You probably know families that still have their Wii hooked up, that might dust it off every once in a while when people come over or whatever. Uh, now, I'm not saying we're 15 years. What I'm saying is because graphics and hardware aren't our focal point, that's not what we're interested in. We focus more on the design and the fun factor and the multiplayer capabilities. That's what our system focuses on. You won't hear me talk about teraflops and, and real-time sweats beating down their face. No. What, what, so we, we feel we could probably get another couple years out before we did like an Amico 2 or whatever, whatever the next thing would be. Um, and so we're probably, probably closer to like eight or nine years, probably. Yeah. And let's piggyback this onto the Wii a little bit, since you've brought it up a few times. Sure. Now, the Wii was unquestionably a gigantic and surprising yeah. success, given mm -hmm. the industry at the time that it came out. But there were a lot of people, like you mentioned earlier, yeah. who bought a Wii and then never bought another game for it. They just played Wii Sports for maybe right. a few months and then set it on a shelf and never touched it again. I feel that for a lot of the core and enthusiast gamers, you know, they picked one up, probably played it for it a did. few years, and yep. then mostly moved on to more traditional consoles and controllers. So with the Amico, how do you plan to yeah. reach these consumers, not just for the initial sale, but to keep them engaged and hang on to them over a longer period of time? It's a great question. See, I, I worked on Metroid Prime, right? And that was one of the one of the uh, games that came out on Wii, um, you know, initially or whatever. And and see, the thing to remember is that when Nintendo came out with the Wii, um, they weren't trying to sell a system to my mom. They weren't, you know, they were just trying to pivot because, I mean, quite frankly, they were getting their butts handed to them by Sony and Microsoft you know, at, at, at that time, so can, Sony and Microsoft had kind of taken over. And so they had, and they, they didn't want to play that game, that, that technology game with them. And they were very smart. They said, you know what? And, and again, kind of what we're saying now, right? We're not going to play the technology game with Sony and Microsoft and, or the infrastructure game with a company like Google or Nintendo, you know, we're doing our own thing. Right. And so they did their own thing. They pivoted hard, right. You know, and, and, but what they r quickly realized, they kind of caught lightning in a bottle and they said, oh my gosh, nursing homes are buying this thing. You know, Tommy's mom is buying this thing. Non-gamers are like interested in this thing. 
but they weren't prepared and didn't really ever go after that crowd. What happened when the Wii came out, they pivoted right back to what they know. By the way, they know their target audience better than any company out there, better than Sony and better than Microsoft. Those folks who grew up on Pokemon, Zelda, Mario, the kids of the late 80s, you know, a lot of millennials who grew up on Nintendo, that's who they cater to. And that's why they're a billion dollar company, right? And so when you look at what happened with the Wii, when it came out, what did they do? Nintendo first party, they went right back to their wheelhouse. Metroid, Pikmin, uh, Pokemon, Zelda, Mario, boom, right? Smash Brothers, boom, right back to it. Now they did come out with a couple other, well, let's do Wii Sports Resort. Now, look where Wii Sports Resort is on the top 10 best-selling games ever of all time. It's right there. So it's like, you know, and, and then what happened is, all the other third-party companies, the Ubisofts, the EAs, the Activisions, THQs, their A-teams, their triple-A teams, their best teams, they were working on PlayStation and Xbox and PC. And initially, they weren't going to be supporting the Wii because no one believed in it. Then all of a sudden, it becomes a big hit, and they're like, um, you know what? Put that team on it. Yeah, there was that big scramble after scramble. that first year or so. And what happened? It was a bunch of junk. Yeah, you had a lot of the B teams putting out uh, stuff that was lower quality than what the same companies were doing on other consoles for the most part. You know, and so so that's a really interesting look at 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 you know what happened with the Wii. Nintendo first party should have doubled and tripled down on putting out super simple casual games, right? To keep those people engaged. My mom never bought another game, right? And so we learn from that. We, we see that, we understand it, and we learn from it. But see, the big difference with Amico is, is that our target audience is actually the people who Nintendo kind of, you know, ignored or kind of didn't really focus too hard on right that's our core audience so we have lots of stuff for them and then you also mentioned the um you know the controller thing and you know we're not heavily relying on motion controls for all our games they're a very small percentage right we have cornhole and we use them somewhere here and there whereas with the wii it was like the main focus for a long time, right? So pe people started to lose interest because, I mean, I'll be the first one to it. Like, like, I don't love motion controls. No, it was one of those things where you first got it, started messing with it, and it seemed like it was really cool. And you're like, hey, novelty. this is fun. Yeah. And then when something like Zelda Skyward Sword came along, and now you've got to like ah, hold the sword and awful. aim it one-to-one -one throughout awful. the whole entire game. You know, a, a lot of people would sit down and play Zelda for three to four hours. And I mean, it's just not comfortable holding and waggling exactly. the Wii mode for that know, amount of and time. And imagine a game like Tony Hawk Pro Skater, right? Like motion controls, come on. You know, so, so again, we understand this. Our focus is not motion controls, but we certainly have a variety and it's mostly like recreational sports, you know. So just to uh, target this a little bit. Yeah. When it comes to keeping people engaged, like say those people who bought a Wii and then never bought yeah. another game for it. How do you keep those people coming back on yeah. the Amico so, and retaining that audience, which is something that Nintendo had failed to do? So we have 30 games that'll be on launch uh, when we launch in April. And then we're every two weeks, we're going to put out a brand new game. And so we're going to, we have them stockpiled. And so we'll put them out. So there's always going to be something new. Now, how do you get people to recognize and understand that though? The big difference is you don't have to go to a store. You don't, basically every time you turn Amico on, there's, it's going to show the new game that comes out. It's going to spotlight it with a running video right there in your library. And because we'll know what types of games those families or those people have been purchasing, we can then 
highlight for them, like they do on like Amazon Prime or Netflix. If you like this, then you'll probably like this. Um, so, so if if we so are we talking about things that are going to be personalized to an yes. individual console or something that goes out to a larger group? Yeah, no, no, individual consoles. So, so like if we know that a, a family has bought a lot of board games and card games and dice games, and they haven't bought any retro reimagined games, then you know we could you know put. A, a board game or a card game or a new dice game, we can feature that in their library. Um, and, and again, if you see it the other way around as well too, if, if we see like, oh, wow, there's a, th all this person gets is retro reimagined. Well, I'm not going to throw, and, and so if we kind of assume maybe they don't have any kids or what, like we're not going to throw Sesame Street up. Hey, a new Sesame Street game came out. No, we're going to throw up, hey, a new Frogger you know, eight player Frogger game is out or whatever. Burger Time's now launched, you know, so we're going to be very smart and use, you know, the, the, the data, which is a very modern thing, right? Again, they use it on Amazon and Netflix every day, you know? Okay. So one thing I'm going to mention here so that people don't get furious in the comments is that Metroid Prime, the first two entries were initially for the GameCube. And then the third one, you know, was for the Wii. It was. Yeah. I worked on it. I, I worked on it. Yeah. I, I know. I know. You mentioned it as Wii before. Well, so I, I, just I mean, I mentioned that it was. Clear that up so nobody jumps in the comments and starts angrily typing. He didn't even say anything when it was mentioned for a different system. Right. Yes. 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 Yeah. For the, yeah, the, the folks who want to nitpick. Yeah. It was on the Wii, but it came out on the GameCube first. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Next, uh, I want to talk about price for a moment. Sure. So obviously I know you know this stuff, but just for the benefit of everyone watching, there's a lot more that goes into the price of a system than just the cost of its component parts. Right. Some of the other factors include things like research and development, manufacturing, distribution, you know, etc. So we'll keep all that in mind. And as we do, can you tell us what it costs to manufacture one Amico unit complete with its two controllers and everything it comes with. Sure. So when it's, uh, so with the two controllers and burning the games on there and getting it all ready to go. Now this is before, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, this is before it ships to the stores, before it gets to the distributors. Because remember there's distributors. So you ship it to the distributors and then they distribute it to the stores and then the stores take their percentage as well, right? So it's important to note, you know, this number that I'm throwing out, there's also more percentages and numbers on top of that, but it costs around $200 to currently to manufacture. Now with electronics, those parts start to go down. But again, let me just, I just want to be hundred percent clear. When I say it's $200, that doesn't mean that in television sells them for two forty nine, and in television makes forty nine dollars. Nope, not even close. It's not the way it works. You th that is the raw cost of the machine to get it on the shores of the United States, and then there's a middleman that they're called three PL. Uh, people can Google that. Um, the, you know, the folks that take it and then put it in all the warehouses and all the, whether it's Walmarts or Best Buy or Amazon or whatever, boom. So there's those people, middleman, they need a profit. There's the shipping of all that. There's the warehousing as well. If they're sitting in a warehouse somewhere, you get, you don't get that for free. You don't, people just don't, oh, just here, use my warehouse for free. All these different things. Then it gets to the store. Then the store needs to mark it up as well. So so it's around 200 bucks before all that other retail and shipping and, and uh, storage stuff. And one thing I'll add here is that, you know, companies okay. are allowed to make a profit off the items that they sell. <laughs> no, I'm doing this. Yeah. That's something that I think a, lo a lot of people just don't understand with the products that they buy. Isn't it funny? Yeah, the, oh, you're charging too much because you're pocketing money. No, we're not. If, you know. Now, some companies, you know, I won't call them out specifically, but you know, they're way on the wrong end of that spectrum where they're just taking in yes. way too much money on the things that they're selling. But that's not the kind of stuff that we're talking about with the game industry and consoles.
No, we have a, a game. No, by the way, no game system. You want to know how much Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo, do you want to know how much those stores make on selling that hardware? A four, three hundred and four hundred dollar item. The stores between five and ten dollars. Five dollars, five bucks. That's how small margin there is in electronics these days. And COVID isn't helping. Look, you know, before COVID, before all the you know the crisis of all components and like you know we were about ten dollars under that. We were at about one ninety, right? But everything went up and everything goes up, you know, because of COVID. Still. And also that brings us to kind of a natural next question. In the past, a lot of companies have followed the whole razor and blades analogy or principle where the companies might sell the console at very little profit or even take a loss on it to then make up some of the money on software sales and licensing. And with the pricing structure for the Amico regarding both hardware and games, that type of model can't really work with it, right? Exactly. And what we did is we took a little bit of a balancing approach to that, right? So we're not, you know, because again, my two biggest things for our consumers, for our customers, the two biggest things I want to build are trust and value. If I can show trust and value to our consumers, then the, the success comes and the money and all that stuff comes flowing. But all these mobile companies, their number one thing is not trust, it's money. How can we suck money out of people, right? Um, and so trust and value, that's what we're building with our customers more than anything. So could I have sold uh, Amico at 150 bucks retail and it would have had one controller and no games like other companies could have would have done maybe? Yeah, I could have done that, but our market research showed that the, that the audience that we're going for, they just want to have an all-in-one thing. They just want to be able to buy it, take it out of the box, and be able to play. That's why it's so cool that you can download our free app and have up to eight mobile devices connected. Now, they don't work great with the action games. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you, you know. But, but, for the, but for the simple card games and dice games and party games and stuff, board games, they're fine. It's totally fine. We're not going to force people to buy the And so just to clarify a point on that one, when it comes to the total maximum number of controllers, um, that's eight controllers total. So you could have, say, two Amico controllers and then like six mobile phones. Correct. It's a combination of anything. Yeah. So it's it could be four controllers and four apps or six apps and two controllers or whatever, any combination thereof. Yeah, yeah. And, and j another kind of point of interest that you might find interesting is that, is that the controllers, they run off of Bluetooth. So they connect Bluetooth to Amico, to the base and, and the apps run off Wi-Fi. So just, just as a point of clarification as well for a, any techies out there, but you're talking about the razor blades versus the, yeah. And so to, to kind of finish that. Okay. So what we've done is, is we're making, you know, a little bit more on the console than $5, but we don't have to charge 50, $60 for games. So, so we're kind of balancing it. We're doing something that no one's ever done before, basically in, in the video game industry, you know? So we're, we're like, you know what, let's not, because right now, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative right now is you pay a lot for the console and you pay a lot for the games, right? And so a lot of these games, 10, 15, $20 million budgets, some of these games now, 60, 70, you can buy versions of, you know, games that are a hundred dollars on the PlayStation and Xbox, the limited edition, this and that. Right. And so because we don't have that big $10 million crazy budgets, cause we're not trying to make those kind of games, our budgets are much lower, but what I'm doing, we're doing is we're passing that savings onto the end user. One of the four major pillars in the concept of the Amigo is affordability. Do you think at the price point of two forty nine ninety nine? that you've achieved that, especially in these times we're in right now where people may have less disposable income to spend? Now, like I said, I think our magic number is 199. 
but let's talk about value. 15 years ago, Nintendo Wii came out 15 years ago with one motion controller and one game, Wii Sports, which was really just a tech demo for four games, bowling, boxing, baseball, and tennis. They weren't even a complete, you couldn't even play a complete game of bowling. You played three, right? So the Nintendo Wii, and again, remember who our target is, right? I mean, to our target audience, I mean, or sorry, to, our, to the hardcore gamers, we're half the price as the next generation. So, so ask them who are going to be spending five, six, seven hundred bucks to get multiple controllers in the first round of games. We're going to be a third of the price for the same amount of games, right? So, so to them, we're, we're, you know, a good, a good deal, but to our target audience, remember 15 years ago, do you remember the cost of the Wii? $249 with one controller and one tech demo. Our thing, our proposition to those same people is same price 15 years later, two controllers, which are a lot of technology in it, including a color touchscreen, and six complete games, not demos of games, six complete full games that all have multiplayer. Now, when you sell it like that, now all of a sudden, and, oh, wait, but and all of our games are $9.99 or less forever. And no in-app purchases, no in-app advertising, no loot boxes, no fancy DLC that's going to charge you. Now you can start to see, and for middle, let's say middle America, you say to a mom, hey, mom, $9.99 or less, no loot boxes, no ads, all family games, and guess, guess what? No violence, bad language, sexual content, everything's rated E for everyone and family friendly. Those couple things that I just mentioned are more important to those people than teraflops, than cutting edge, blah, 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 than real time, blah, 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 blah. All that is a hundred times more popular. And now you start to understand why 3 billion people play this and 3 billion people don't play consoles, you know? So it's, I mean, it's, you know, it all, it all starts to kind of come together. So, so yeah, you know, that, that's our proposition. Now it's going to be up to us to make sure that those people understand that 249 is a hell of a value for what they're getting. That's on us. And we could fail at that, you know, but. Which that kind of rolls into my next question anyway. Uh, what type of marketing push are we going to see for the Amigo as we get closer to launch? Are we going to see TV commercials, online ads, YouTube, radio, print, all that stuff? Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. So, so, the, so the biggest things, the, the biggest things we'll be doing is, um, is uh, uh, mall tours and in-store demos um, and major influencers. We have some major, major family, mom, technology, not hardcore gamers, family, uh, females, kids. We have people that have 10 to 15 million subscribers on YouTube already lined up. And so we haven't, we haven't started spending a single dime in advertising, not a single thing, yet we have, you know, 30,000 new people added to our email list just this year alone, right? And that's just from me out there talking to folks like yourself, and maybe we'll get two or three people to sign up to our uh, mailing list from this, and then a bunch of other people will watch this in a month from now. And, you know, so it all, it's all kind of grassroots right now and we're not spending any money. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll do, I, I don't care if you have a hundred subscribers or a million right now. I'm talk. I'll talk to anyone because it's content that me and you are creating right now that, you know, we're creating content for the internet. So when, when we start our big advertising and when people start doing searches on YouTube and they see interviews and they see, they're going to be watching this content. It's going to be good for you. going to be good for me. 
Um, and so that's our plan. But but yes, television, absolutely. Um, you know, again, imagine me pitching on something like QVC. If I could say, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, like it, with with hosts, like these are the types of things we're going. You know, our target is going to be like religious groups. You know, Christian, uh, uh, Latino community. Uh, which are very family oriented. Italians are family oriented too, but but so many parts of the industry that the normal video game industry completely ignores. Completely ignores, right? We're not going to seniors is another demographic, right? So the demographics that we're going for. Are you familiar with the AARP? Yeah. Okay, AARP is the biggest magazine and biggest club organization nonprofit in the entire United States. The magazine goes out to about 35 to 40 million people, right? See how many Nintendo Switch ads or features are, are in AARP or Xbox or Google Stadia or PlayStation. Never in a million years would they, you know, uh, do that. Well, I can tell you that the December issue of AARP, there's a feature with me in it, right? Talking about in television, Amico and my career and, and this and that. See, these are the types of different things that we're doing. Look, look again, I'm not gonna sit here and drink my own Kool-Aid and say, oh yeah, we got a hundred million in marketing. We're gonna compete right with some, no. What we have is we have to be really smart and go after the people who are our target audience, which is another important reason why our licensors are so important because the partnerships that we're doing with Major League Baseball, Sesame Street, Mattel, Hot Wheels, those are just three things right there. And we have a lot more coming, but those are three companies right there that literally have tens of millions of people on their mailing lists on their social media. And, and, and when you partner with these folks and doing the kind of deals that we're doing, they, you know, these are the folks that we're getting to that normally people don't target. And that's super important. So we got a lot of tricks up our sleeve. And going back to cost, let's talk about the controllers. Yep. Um, I know there haven't been any official announcements yet, but you've talked about this a bit in the past. Are you still aiming for between fifty and sixty dollars for the standard editions, and yeah. more for the special editions? Fifty to sixty, we're trying to get. Yeah, we're trying to get it somewhere. In there. But yeah, that's what you're expecting yeah. still, then in that same range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're that's what we're hoping for. Again, the the reason we haven't made the exact announcement of how much we're selling these for individually is that we're still trying to get the component price down on some of the stuff that's in here because we will not. We will not go cheap. You know, we're, we're not going to go, um, you know, like this is a polycarbonate, right? You can see this whole thing. You can see the glare, you know, all the way down. So we cut out a circle for the disc and, and a little thing for the speaker and the microphone and the, uh, the home button or whatever. But this is one piece and polycarbonate. I mean, look at this, you know, like this, uh, like a phone is glass. Most capacitive touch screens. I, if I smash this on the microphone right now, my phone's screwed. Or if a, if a four-year-old drops it on the ground, it's cracked, right? Yeah. This, I can, I can smack it on this and look, there's no, you know, let me clean it off. You know, there's no scratches on here, you know, like a plastic or a plexiglass would have easily scratched and this and that. So, and, and, and the feeling of this, it's, it's, it's just the right, you know, it's not too heavy. It's not too light, but I uh, can't really tell over over uh, over the thing. There's no way I can do it. But but you know the LED lights on here. I mean you know look at the 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 quality. You know these aren't. We're not like chintzing on the. Uh, look how bright that is, right? Um, again the you know the gyroscope and the accelerometer. You know yeah we could use cheaper parts if we wanted to. But look at look at how smooth it is. The capacitive touch screen. We could have went with a cheaper screen. Look at look at the response. It's perfect, right? Um, and the, the disc, you can see the discs. Yeah, look how you so and then the harder I push down on the disc, you see the the, the bar on the top is going up. Yeah. So it, it even it even you know features that force feedback. 
um, all that stuff. You know, we just put in a brand new feedback motor uh, a couple of weeks ago because we found one that was the same price as the one we already had, but was a little more powerful. Same thing with the speaker, same thing with the microphone. So we're going into mass production on January 2nd, okay? And so we, but we're in our massive testing mode now. So, and then compliance modes as well, because you have to get compliance from so many, like just turn over any piece of electronic and you'll see all the CEs and the, all the different, you know, in, in, for a video game system of what we're doing and something that's family and for kids, just in the United States alone, we have 25 different compliance companies that we have to go through before we can even sell a single one. That's in the US. In Europe and Canada, add 25 more. So we have to do 50 different compliance things um, you know, before we have it all finished. So, so yeah, so that's the reason I'm trying to keep it 50 to 60 bucks. I'm trying, trying, trying. Um, and that's us making, you know, very little profit because the, you know, retailers want to make a lot on the accessories. That's where they make up their margins because our games, we're going to have physical media as well. Um, but even the physical media is not going to be 30, 40, 50 bucks, you know, it's going to be around 1999. So, so, you know, we have to find out margin somewhere. So that and, will uh, sort of lead into my next two questions. What proportion of the total cost of the Amico is made up of the controller cost? Almost half, not, not, not exactly half. So, and so that's the total for the two of them that are included, right? Say again. That's the total for the two that are included with the system. Correct. Right. So, so again, you know, let, let's break it down. I said it was 200. I said almost half. So again, you, you know, what does it cost to make one of these things? I mean, basically think about this. We've made, it's almost like we've made a, a, a mobile phone without the 4G, right? You know, and we've added complex buttons and dials and switches and LED lights, right? So, you know, how much does it cost to a high-end cell phone is, you know, you're, you're paying a thousand to 1500 bucks for the new ones, right? But, but these are, these are clocking in around 45 bucks, right? So again, you know, so that's, there you go. You get $90 out of the 200 I said, right? So 90 and 110 for the base unit itself. Those are, uh, again, I could sit here and refuse to answer those questions. Yeah. But why? I got enough. I got nothing to hide. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, there's no one getting in trouble. I'm, I'm a super, you know, honest upfront, uh, you know, type of person again, that, whoa, that trust in value. Um, but so, so then you think about what you just asked and what I just said earlier, okay, well, if it's costing them 45 bucks to get to the shores and the stores need to, to make 10 bucks and the distributor needs to make, and then you have to store them in a warehouse and then the distributor takes their one or 2% or whatever. Now you start to see, well, how the hell is he gonna do these for 50 bucks? The only way I'd be able to do it for 50 bucks is if we, we can figure out how to find $5 savings. And again, eventually over time, you know, component prices start to go down. Memory starts to go down. We see it happening. But, you know, I mean, look, even if the worst case scenario is, you know, the prices are like 59, whatever, 64, whatever, even if that's the worst case scenario, keep in mind, a Nintendo Switch Joy-Con is $79, right? You know, and, and the PlayStation Xbox controllers, they're 59, 69 bucks, and they don't have screens on them. Now, you can get them on. It kind of drives me nuts. The cost for modern controllers, for but there's any so system. much technology in there, and and yeah. again, and people don't don't forget also, folks, that the cost to develop it, right? I mean, you, you know, the it's not just how much does this cost, but what did it cost to develop it? Even I, I haven't even factored in any of that in any prices I'm giving you. Oh yeah, I know. And we talked about that a little bit before when we were talking about all the things that go into the yeah. price of the system. Uh, you know, as well as the intangibles, the things you don't see just by looking at it. So I have another question that will also lead us into the games a little bit. So the physical releases yeah. for the Amico are going to be a little bit different than Unique. what we've seen yeah. for other systems in the past. Uh, can you elaborate on that just a little bit for us? 
Yeah, I mean, I can't get into what they are because we are going to be making a special announcement later this year and we want to show it and we want to have different things. Here's what I'll say. Uh, the physical media is actually comes in a, in a couple of, a number of different forms. Okay. So that's, that's one, one thing uh, that's kind of cool and I can and share with you. So it's not just, oh, it's a disc or, oh, it's a, a mini, uh, uh, you know, SD or whatever. It's not that, right? We have, a, we have an SD slot in the back, but that's so that you can expand the memory. So for example, you get 32 gig on board. That's something that we upgraded uh, this year because it was 16 last year, but we wanted, so we got 32 and, and the, the games are anywhere from 300 KB, all, you know, well, the average is 300 like around, megabytes to one gigabyte. Yeah. It, it's, it's about, the average is about 500 K, well, right? Nice. So on the 32, what's that? Megabytes. No, sorry. I, 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 yeah. Hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you for not making me sound like a moron, uh, which I did. But uh, yes, exactly. I always, I always we all have so, those yeah. moments with kilobytes, right? megabytes, especially and gigabytes. with megabytes, K's, gigs, terabytes. What the hell? How many ter? How many gigs in a terabyte? One thousand twenty-four. Look at this guy. He's a pro. Um, but anyway, so, um, so yeah, so, so 500 megabytes. So even with that, and you include our OS and the six free games that you'll have, you'll still be able to store like 30 to 50 games just on the internal. Let's come back to the internal stuff in a little bit here. Right. Okay. For the physical games. So, so for the physical media. Yeah. So the slot in the back is if you want to expand on that, you want to put a 128 gig in there. You'll, you'll be able to own every Amico game for the next five years, right? Um, but so, but for the physical media, you do not have to be. So, so let's let. Here's a question a lot of people ask: Does the system have to be connected to the internet in order to play games? No, not at all. You can buy that thing, take it to a campground, plug it into a generator, and and play all the games that are on your hard drive. Do you need an internet connection in order to download new games? Yes, including the physical media. Okay, yeah. So, I, I didn't know if yeah. you were going to be able but, to talk about that. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, but, 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 but can you detach the physical media from your system and give it to somebody else or sell it on eBay? Yes, you can. So it's exactly like physical media. So for example, if you bought Call of Duty and you had the, the Blu-ray disc, right? And you played it, you played it, you played it on your machine. Then you wanted to get rid of it. You'd get rid of that disc, right? Well, it's the same exact thing with our physical media. You, you buy the physical media, you get it on your machine, you play it, you play it, you want to get rid of it. Then you can detach it and it becomes live on, on, on the, uh, the media again. Sounds good, right? I mean, it sounds reasonable. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, get, can you talk about anything about what packaging will be like? Will it be something collectors will like, say, like a plastic clamshell? or Collect Collectors are going to love it. Collectors, I mean, I, I, I did it for collectors. Um, I didn't do it for grandma. They're, they're for collectors. And again, we have some some really cool partnerships. Uh, it's all gonna be coming by the end of the year and we're gonna be showing some things then. But again, remember what I said though, it's not just one, collectors are gonna love certain things. Kids may love other things. And, and grandma may like something else completely different from those two things. So we're gonna, we're gonna, there's gonna be a variety. And I have a feeling a lot of people Probably know where you're going probably, with that statement. Probably. Uh, the term RFID has been out there for a while. But uh, I, I won't go into that anymore at this point. And pricing. The pricing for the physical media, uh, the games will cost a little more than the same version as a download. Yeah. Yeah. So we got to make them good. So with physical media, we talked about last time, they would cost somewhere between $15 and $30 okay. on average. Is that the low end? Uh, no, 15 to we're, we're hoping for, we're, we're hoping for 1999 or less. Oh, 20 will be the top. Yeah. Okay. That's what we're hoping for. Yeah. 
All right, so you're talking about a max of twenty dollars for a physical so game twice the price. versus ten dollars for a downloadable yep. game. And yep. what I wanted to add in here is that's how it should be. <laughs> you Thank know, you. you have Sony, Thank Microsoft, you. and Nintendo. It's Thank kind of you. ridiculous that they charge the same amount of money for a downloadable game that they do for a physical game. They have almost no costs associated with a downloadable game other than the cost of development. They don't have shipping. They don't have the manufacturing of the product. They don't have the, the distributor 3PL. They don't have the markup from retail. So why is a digital game $69 when the physical is $69? Thank you for bringing it up. And when they first started selling these things, when digital downloads of full games first became available, I remember there was a lot of hubbub in the media at the time yeah. and criticism that asked, hey, why does the download yeah. of the game cost the same as the physical version of the game? And, you know, we never really got a good answer for that in all this time. But do you see what I'm saying, though? Do you see what I'm saying, though, when you start to understand the story and you start to get in the details, why I say that value and trust to our folks, you know what I mean? Like, like again, it's no in-app purchases, none of that... Uh, all that microtransactions, none of that. We we want to be transparent. And, and, and as a CEO, I'm sorry, but I don't know of any other CEO that's been as transparent as I have over the last couple of years. I've answered every one of your questions, right? You know, I haven't dodged it. You haven't heard the talking points that marketing wanted. Me. Yeah, I've been occasionally surprised by some of the things I've seen you answer in other interviews. Yeah. Yeah, and, and by the way, people people get angry at me for it. People say, you know, oh, he's he, you know, he said something last year, and now he's changed this year. Well, yeah, because things change, but and he's a liar. No, I'm not a liar. At the time, that's what we were doing and hoping for, and I was honest enough to give an answer for that. So don't hold that against me because a year later, you know, we ended up you know, doing something. And it's usually for a positive reason why we do like, he's a liar. He said the machine only had 16 GB on board. Now it's 32. He's a liar. Well, I mean, come on, you know, it's like, and have you had many, he's a liar complaints over that one? Not over People that don't one. Usually tend to get upset when you give them more. Well, you'd be surprised. There's, 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 you know, there, there's, there's a certain, uh, a certain handful of folks out there who, uh, who try to twist every single little thing I say to, you know, try to make me sound like a liar, which, which again is funny considering I'm actually the exact opposite of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And changing gears a little bit. Yeah. One thing we had discussed uh, before is that you would allow games to exceed that current one gigabyte maximum that we're seeing. Right? Ab absolutely. I, I never, ever want to restrict our developers or our creative people by saying, oh, you can't do anything over a gig or you can't do, heck no. And, and by the way, you know, certain games as well, you know, I'm saying 999 or less now as digital product. That's how we're going to launch this, you know, system. But by gosh, if there's like an epic RPG, super simple thing, and it and it's going to take somebody two years to do, and 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 it makes more sense that that gets sold at fourteen ninety nine. Well, then we're going to do. We're not going to say nope. You can't be on our machine. No, you know we're again we're open to everything, but but the value proposition up front on launch, yeah, everything's nine ninety nine. Will will bigger games be maybe more? Uh, you know, more g gigs and more expensive. I'm open to it. We don't have anything in the pipeline now, but I wouldn't, I would never shut that down. You know, A little bit earlier you were talking and uh, let me back up a little bit. For anyone who skipped the intro, uh, you and I had a discussion uh, prior to this one. We had a problem with the recording. We discussed some, but not all of the same topics that we're covering here today. So one of the things we had talked about was that in the future, down the road, it's possible there could be games that cost more than $9.99. Now, a little bit earlier in our discussion today, uh, you had said at one point that the games will be $9.99 forever. I, I said $9.99 forever? Yeah, you did a little bit earlier. Okay, I don't, I don't recall saying forever. It was a mistake if I did, but all of our games 
are nine ninety nine or less forever. I just wanted to make sure that I addressed it before we finished up. It might be. By the way, it might be. It might be. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just want to make sure everyone's clear on that. Yeah, future couple years down. Yeah. And with the games that are being released at nine ninety nine, you know, they're they're not gonna, you know, magically go up in price. No. What we're talking ne- about never, is never. games that are released yeah. later. Other games could possibly be more. Yeah, than future couple years down. Yeah. Along the same lines, another thing that we had talked about last time was I had asked you if there would be any games that could exceed the rating of E10+. Plus. And your answer to that was? Definitely no. That, that, we, won't, that we won't bend our knee on uh, at all. Uh, and again, that's, that's part of the trust factor with, with families, with moms, with grandparents. Uh, and, and by the way, we don't feel we need it. There's no reason to, you know, most people don't understand that you know, 80% of the games that are out there already are E10 or, or, or E for everyone. You know, Castlevania, Contra, you know, if you shoot somebody and they don't bleed and they just blink and go away, that's E10. Castlevania is E, you know. So, so you know, what, what teen means, the next one up from E plus 10, what that means is that it's mild blood, mild violence, mild sexual uh, you know, situations, mild nudity, you know, that's, and so it's like, we don't need to go there. You know, we don't, we don't, not something we're interested in. And look, I'm not against any of that stuff. I'm not like, Oh, he's a censorship. What are you talking about? You know, go, go, go into YouTube and, and put in Tellerico Ted talk and you'll see a Ted talk I did, you know, five, six, seven years ago, defending the video game industry, against that kind of content. I just don't want it on our machine. I'm not against it. I'm not against developers making it. I just don't want it on on what we're doing. And, and again, who our target market is. And it, we don't need it. Look, we didn't need it growing up as kids, did we? In the early days, there you know, wasn't much of that. Every game anyway. I played was... I mean, some of it squeaked by. Right? But that's... So, uh, well, I go. guess the rating system exists today. Right. You know, I, I guess here's here's my point for folks out there is that even if the machine isn't for you, and even if it's not something that you'd be interested in, or maybe you feel it's out of your price range for what it is right now, totally understandable. What I would say though, is that you should at least try to root for us because it's something that's unique. We are the underdogs in this whole thing, trying to go, you know, at least hope for our success, even though it might not be you. I mean, that's, that would be, I don't know. I think that's fair to ask for. So thanks again for taking the time to sit down with me today and answer some questions about the Amico. I'd really love to do it again sometime. Absolutely. Let's let's do it again in a couple more weeks or something. Tommy Tellerico, everybody. So there you go, my retro gaming friends. That's my interview with Tommy Tellerico. If you like this and you want to see more upcoming interviews, feel free to subscribe to the channel like this video, and all that YouTube jazz. With that, I'll say thanks for watching, and see me later.